Okay, let's pray together before we start our Bible study. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here this evening to hear from your word. God, I pray that we would understand the Bible tonight. God, would you please speak to me and through me into the hearts of everyone here this evening. May you be magnified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As Christians, we've been called to be different, to become more like Jesus. Sometimes it's easy and it doesn't require a lot of sacrifice, like putting a verse in your Instagram bio. It's easy to do that. It's not, it's not hard. And then other times, it's tough and our faith is challenged and it's difficult to be courageous and to be like Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to be compassionate to people. Sometimes it's tough to speak the truth in a clear way because we know that the truth is sometimes offensive. And then standing up in the face of attacks is difficult, so sometimes we shy away from that. We've been called to be courageous, to declare Jesus and not to deny Jesus. But why is it important that we live this way? We're going to be answering that question tonight. Amendment 4 didn't pass. And at family church and as Christians, we celebrate that and we praise God that that fell. It wasn't a political issue. It's a life issue. And it was voted no. Praise God. And we celebrate what the Lord did in that and in other ways. But what would we have done if that passed? What if the overwhelming majority voted yes on that? Well, we would still need to be an example of Christ. We would still need to be courageous in the face of that. So why is it important to become more like Jesus, and how do we become more like Jesus? He's called us to this. He's called us to be more like him, and he, he equips us, and he helps us to know that. So why should we become more like Jesus, and how do we become more like him? That's the question that we're going to answer this evening. As a little boy, Jim wanted to be a missionary to unreached people groups. When he became an adult, he moved to South America and studied Spanish. He shared the gospel with the Quechua Indians who were being killed by the Aka Indians. After many Quechuas received Christ by faith, Jim went with his friends, Ed, Roger, Nate, and Pete, to the area where the Aka's lived. Nate Saint was a friend of Jim, and he went with him. He was a missionary supply pilot. And he came, he, came, he came up with an idea to lower a bucket filled with supplies to the Aka Indians on the ground. He thought that was going to be a safer option and a way to earn the trust of the Aka Indians by giving them supplies. They were learning Aka phrases, and after many months, the Akas even sent a gift back up in a bucket to the plane. So Jim and the other missionaries felt like the time had come to meet the Akas face to face. So one day, flying over the Aka territory, Nate Saint spotted a beach that was long enough for him to land the plane on. One by one, missionaries started getting sent into that area. They began meeting a couple of the Aka people, having relationship built with them. They had some, some meals, they had some conversations, and they thought like they were making good progress. So Jim and his friends said, hey, go invite more people to meet us so we can share the gospel with them. So they waited a couple days, and as they're waiting on the beach, they saw two Aka women walking out of the jungle towards them. So Nate and Jim got excited, and they waded across the water that was between the beach and the jungle to them with excitement. But then they saw that the women didn't look friendly. They were coming in an attacking way, and then they heard noises all around them. And then they realized that they were surrounded by the Aka warriors. Jim had a gun in his pocket, and it said that he thought about drawing it, but then he remembered that he made a promise that he wouldn't kill any Aka Indians who were attacking him. So he left it alone, and because of that decision, this boy, Jim, who desired to be a missionary his whole life, lands, makes first contact with them, and because he doesn't protect himself, the warriors around him kill him, and all of his friends. Ed, Roger, Nate, Pete, and Jim, Jim Elliott, all passed away on that day. 
What happened after that was um, Jim's wife, Elizabeth, was, she would always listen on a two-way radio to Nate's conversation with his wife. And that evening, they went to listen together to, to hear what the report was, and they didn't hear anything. And they, they knew that no news this time was bad news. Americans sent a search party to go look for them, but they, they found them passed away on the beach with their plane destroyed by the Indian warriors. That's a lot of courage to go into that area. Jim knew what he was getting into. The Aka Indians killed a lot of the Kichiwa Indians who he was doing ministry with first. So he knew what he was signing up for when he got in a plane with his friends to go to that village, but he knew that he was called to do it. He had compassion on them. He had clarity in the mission to go and take them the gospel. And he had the courage, he had the boldness with his friends to go and share the gospel with them. And I'm sure that all of us have needed to be courageous at some point in our life. It could be as simple as climbing a mountain and walking to the edge of the cliff and looking over. I don't know if any of you have ever done that, but it's pretty fun when your feet are dangling over 10,000 feet. But there's some courage with that. Also skydiving or swimming with sharks, which I would suggest because it's a lot of fun, right? Swimming with sharks is great, but it requires some courage. So those are like more surface level examples, but let's go a little deeper with it. We're called to be courageous even when standing up maybe to a boss who is making an unethical decision in the workplace that you work at. Or maybe talking to family about conflict among relatives. Or sharing the gospel with family or friends or people you don't know. It takes courage to do this. And Jesus wants us to do this because he wants us to become like him. And these areas of courageousness and clarity and compassion. These are just three areas that we can can adopt in our own life and live out because Jesus is equipping us to do it. The Holy Spirit is equipping us to do it. So sometimes it's easy to beat ourselves up a little bit when we're not living courageously like we think we should. If we didn't pray for that neighbor or we didn't share the gospel like we thought we should, Maybe we'll feel like a coward in that moment. Ah, I should have prayed with them. I should have said something more about Jesus instead of just God bless on the way out of the store. Sometimes that happens and we feel like maybe we missed an opportunity and we beat ourselves up a little bit. But this evening, we're going to see from Scripture an example of Peter, how he went from coward to courage, from denying Jesus to declaring Jesus. Jesus was kind to Peter, and he restored him when Peter denied Jesus. Peter wanted to walk as Jesus walked, and the Holy Spirit made him possible, made it possible for him to do that. He wanted to walk as Jesus walked, and because of the Holy Spirit, he was able to take those steps and walk as Jesus did. So as we walk this life with Jesus, the Holy Spirit allows us to live as Jesus lived, This evening, we're going to talk about three ways the Holy Spirit helps us become more like Jesus. Three ways the Holy Spirit helps us become more like Jesus. Why is it important that we become more like Jesus, and how do we become more like him? Two important questions throughout the course of this Bible study will answer those questions together. And to do that, we're going to start by talking about pneumatology. Everyone say pneumatology. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. There you go. You learned a theological term this evening. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that was given to us after Jesus ascended back into heaven. So Jesus dies on the cross He's buried. He raises from the dead three days later. He's living on the earth for 40 more days, talking and teaching his disciples. And then he ascends to heaven. And then he promises to give the helper, the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit comes. So when someone puts their trust in Jesus, 
They put their faith in the fact that Jesus died for their sin, that he was buried, and that he came back to life three days later, and they repent or turn from their sin, and they put their faith in Jesus, then they receive the Holy Spirit by faith. That is the third person of the Trinity who resides in me. And if you put your faith in Christ, he resides in you. And if you're sitting here this evening and you haven't yet put your faith in Jesus, you have an opportunity to do that this evening. And if you do, then the Holy Spirit will move inside of your life. When the Holy Spirit moves inside of you, you get all of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. You don't get a little bit to start and then it grows later. You get all of them at the beginning. You're not getting the Palm Beach Outlets Holy Spirit. You're getting the Worth Avenue Holy Spirit. You're getting the, the top of the line, the best, like at the moment of salvation. You don't need to work for it or try to earn it. You get all of them right away. Who remembers layaway? I'm only 31, but I remember layaway. My parents always put stuff on layaway. Four of you? There's older people in here than that. Come on. Who remembers layaway? Walmart and stuff? Okay, great. So layaway, if you don't have the money to buy something or you don't have the car that can fit the thing or whatever, you put it on layaway. I want that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait. So you want that grill, but you don't have the money yet? Layaway. You want that matching luggage set, but your spouse isn't convinced? Layaway. You want the basketball hoop, but you don't have the right car to take it home? Layaway. You don't get saved and then get the Holy Spirit later. There's not this long transaction that has to take place before you receive the Holy Spirit. Once you pray to receive Christ, you got him right away. And you got the full Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will sanctify you. He will help you think, act, and feel like Jesus does. He will help you become more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who does that. Sanctification is the process of becoming more like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit desires to help you do that. And he wants to. And he's committed to doing that. The Holy Spirit is who we receive by faith. And he will help us become like Jesus. So this is our eighth week in our 10 Foundational Truth series. We've gone through awesome ones up to this point. We only got two left after this. It's crazy that we're this far into it. And each foundational truth has motions, right? We're not going to go through all seven leading up to this. We're just going to do the motions for this evening. But it's that the Holy Spirit, pause, who's seen uh, Napoleon Dynamite? It's like Happy Hands Club. All right. I didn't make this up, but it's good. The Holy Spirit helps us become like Jesus. Remember a couple weeks ago how we talked about how Jesus came to rescue sinners? Well, now the Holy Spirit is helping us become like Jesus. Sinner is not our identity anymore. The Holy Spirit is changing us. He's helping us become like Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about this evening. So let's see how the Holy Spirit helped Peter and shaped him into the image of God. So we're going to start in the book of Luke, chapter 22. Verses 54 to 62. We're going to start here and then get to the boldness of Peter later. But as we start reading this text, this is right before Jesus is about to be crucified. They had just finished the, uh, the Last Supper. Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, no way, I'm never going to do that. And then we get to chapter 22. So Luke 22, starting in verse 54, Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him, sat as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And then a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour or so, another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Check out verse 61. This is powerful. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. 
Peter did what he said he would never do. And he did it three times. I'll never deny you, Jesus. And then he did it three times. And then, like it says in verse 61, the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. Could you imagine being Peter in that moment? I'm not sure what kind of look Jesus gave him. It could have been sadness. It could have been compassion, maybe love. Maybe it was mercy and grace. I'm not sure the look that was on Jesus' face, but whatever it was, it was impactful to Peter. He remembered that look for the rest of his life, guaranteed. It was impactful. He left. He wept bitterly. But it motivated him to never deny Jesus again. He wanted to walk as Jesus walked. So before we get into the main text in Acts chapter 4, let, let me just give you a, a quick timeline of, of what's happening. So Passover was happening during this time that Jesus was crucified. And then Jesus died on the cross. He goes into the tomb. He raises from the dead. And then 40 days, he walks on the earth with his disciples and his apostles. And he takes them to school. He teaches them all the last minute things that they need to know before Jesus leaves. So he spends 40 days with them. And then he gets everyone together. He gives them the great commission, go and make disciples, baptize them in the, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then he ascends back up into heaven. And then there's a 10-day prayer meeting. And in the last day of that prayer meeting, Pentecost happens, which is when the Holy Spirit comes. And Peter, in that moment, receives the Holy Spirit. They all do. So he goes from coward to courage instantly because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps Peter and John be like Jesus in three ways. He gave them compassion, which is number one on your notes. The Holy Spirit gives you compassion like Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives you compassion like Jesus. So let's look at Acts chapter 3, 1 to 10. This is where this story starts. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about, about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at it him as did John and they said look at us and he fixed his attention on them expecting to receive something from them but Peter said I have no silver and gold but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk verse 7 and he took him by the right hand and he raised him up and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong and leaping up he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God and all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him so this guy had been there for 40 years. People that had been walking into the temple saw this guy laying there for four decades, a long time to be laying there. It's kind of like when, when we drive off the highway and there's someone there, like if you've lived here long enough, you see people, they look familiar. Maybe we really don't notice, but they're there. We see people asking for things and then we, we drive by. That's the, the scene here. People lining this temple area, people just walking in back and forth, not really paying attention to them. But then Peter and John walk in and they see this guy and Peter directs his gaze at him. Then he says, look back at me. And this guy's expecting to receive something from them, but Peter is filled with compassion. He has the Holy Spirit. Think about Peter in the Gospels. He's on the move. He's always going, what, what are we doing next, Jesus? But in this moment, his heart's filled with compassion. He slows down. He directs his gaze at him. He tells him to look back at him. This guy's ready to receive money. He's like, you're going to give me something? And he's like, I don't have silver. I don't have any gold. But what I do have is way better. And I'm going to give you the gospel. You guys know that song, the, the silver and gold have I none song? 
You guys familiar with that? All right, I'm going to sing it. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You guys know that song? He went walking and leaping and praising God. And he keeps going. It's great. My mom sang it to me and my sister. Thank you. Thank, yeah, come on. This is my first time singing. That's why I'm not on the worship team. That's all you're going to get. Um, there, but there's like a whole song about this because it's such a big deal. Like they see this guy, he's filled with compassion. He's like, are you going to give me money? He's like, no, it's not about that. I'm going to give you something way better in the name of Jesus who just died two months ago. I'm going to give you through Jesus the ability to walk. And then that drew a crowd. Sometimes we can give monetarily. Sometimes we can give resources or time. In all of those things, we should always be giving the gospel to accompany those things. We should always care about people enough to share the gospel with them. So let's look at Jesus' life. How did Jesus exemplify compassion? While Jesus was on the earth, he talked to the crowds. He was kind with them. He prayed with them. He healed them. He loved people who were outcasts in society. And he didn't push them out, but he brought them in. He lifted them up, pointed them to the Father. Jesus had compassion on people. And we have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus was filled with. So let's strive to have compassion like Jesus did. So here's some practical ways to show, to show compassion and to walk as Jesus walked. You can help launch new churches. Some of you in the room this evening helped launch Thursday night service. You left what you were doing on Sunday morning to help start this. This service for people to be able to come to because they can't go to church on Sunday, but they still want to be able to worship and hear from the word of God. Some of you came and you helped start this. And I'm grateful. And Pastor Jonathan's grateful. And Verati is grateful. Because you're giving of your time. You're being compassionate to a culture and a world and people who want to be able to worship and we're taking the gospel to them. Maybe some of you want to serve and step into this. Great opportunity to do that. We need help. This thing's going to keep growing and we need people to help with that. And you can be a part of it. We also have opportunities to, be, uh, to, to volunteer with community partners. Urban Youth Impact, Feed the Hungry, First Care Women's Clinic, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. These are all partnerships that Family Church has where you can be compassionate and love people. Serve them where they're at. You can go to nursing homes, people who are shut in, who don't maybe have family in the area and they're sitting there lonely. It's a great opportunity to go in, sit with them, talk with them, share the gospel, hear stories from them. Ways to be compassionate, help the homeless, the list goes on. And you have an opportunity, because of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, to be compassionate. So how can you be compassionate right now? I forgot to bring it up with me. Pastor Jonathan, can you hold that up? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Operation Christmas Child. There's a bunch of boxes in the back. This is a great opportunity to put the gospel in this box to get some toys in it, and then give it to Judy, who's going to send it off to wherever, and some kid somewhere in the world is going to receive this and get some toys, but they're going to hear the gospel. And this is a great way to be compassionate. And Judy brought extra boxes, and man, if you want to do this and love someone where they're at in a way that you can, this is a very practical way to do this, even right now. So when Peter and John showed compassion, it caught the attention of a lot of people. Some people loved it, but some people were opposed to it. The ones that were opposed to it gave Peter and John a reason to speak up, and they needed to speak with clarity of what was true. So how did the Holy Spirit help Peter and John be like Jesus? He gave them clarity, which is point two on your notes. The Holy Spirit gives you clarity like Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives you clarity like Jesus. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. This is after uh, Peter and John healed this guy. It's in the same chapter. These are what these two verses say. It says, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, 
that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. So there's a group of people that are like, wow, what just happened? And they're surrounding him. And he's like, hey, you need to repent. Here's the gospel. This is what's true. He had clarity in what he was saying. But that wasn't as hard to tell them because these people were genuinely interested in what happened. But then this other group of people that we're about to read, they came up. They're called the Sadducees. They didn't believe in a resurrection of the dead. And they were giving Peter and John a really hard time, which is where we pick this up in Acts chapter 4 in the first 14 verses. It'll be on the screen behind me, or you could read it on an app or in your Bible. Starting in verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came to them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of men came to about 5,000. I'm going to pause there for a quick minute. The day of Pentecost, anyone know how many people got saved and received Jesus on that day? Yep, 3,000 people. And now we have 5,000 people. So within just a few days, we have 8,000 people that are saved and a part of the first Baptist church of the world. Like, super cool to see what happened because these men are filled. These people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now they're operating in a way that is compassion-filled and they have clarity on what the truth is, and people are experiencing that. So, verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were with the high priestly family. And when they had sat them in the midst, they inquired by what power... Or by what name did you do this? Verse 8. This is so powerful. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Remember, this is a guy who denied Jesus just like two months ago. Then he receives the Spirit, and this is what he says. Full of the Spirit, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means... This man has been healed. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Verse 11, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated common men, and they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So Peter knew what was true, and he shared it confidently. Have you ever tried to talk to someone that wasn't clear on information, and they're trying to give you information about something, but they're not clear on that thing. It's like confusing, right? You're like, do you know what you're talking about? It's kind of like me when I go into a car, like auto repair shop. Like I know how to change a tire and do my oil and air filter and all that, but like I don't study cars. I don't know that much about it. So like I'll walk in and they're like, what brings you in? I'm like, my car's broken. What's wrong with it? I don't know. It's making a weird sound. What kind of sound? I don't know. You have no idea? I don't know. Like a... <laughs> then they make fun of me a little bit, and it's like, okay, well, I, I don't know what to say. Because, like, I'm not clear on what it is. There's a noise. Did you drive in the car and try to fix it? That's why I brought it into you. I don't know what's wrong. I don't have clarity on it. But, like, if I get a ding in my surfboard, I go to a surf shop, be like, hey, I was surfing an 8 Donald Takayama over at that surf break, and this guy on a little short board, 6 hit me, and the nose is dinged, I need solar as Like, I'm clear in that because I surf all the time. I know what I'm talking about. None of you probably knew anything I just said. But it's fine because you're not going to fix my surfboard. But people need clarity when it comes to the Bible. We are clear on things that we know and on things we're passionate about. I'm going to read that one more time. We are clear on things we know and on things that we're passionate about. Peter was passionate about the gospel. 
He had clarity that he represented Christ and he wanted people to know that. The filling of the Spirit in the life of Peter gave him crystal clear clarity. Hard to say three times fast or five times fast, but he, he gave him crystal clear clarity. Peter knew what he was doing. So they ask him this question, how did this man get healed? And then Peter says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, Annas, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, remember him two months ago? You guys killed him. It's by him, it's by his name that I healed this guy. The guy that God raised from the dead, that one that you sent to the cross, his name. I'm clear on who this is. I'm clear on what my mission is. And he was explaining that clearly. He knew what was true and he knew how people could be saved because then he starts talking about salvation in a clear way. He says, and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He made it abundantly clear. Peter didn't him and haw. He didn't go back and forth in his mind and say, yeah, well, you know, you can believe this thing and you can believe this thing and there's many paths to God and you just believe your truth and all that. He's like, no, there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. It's Jesus Christ. That is how someone is saved. So let's look at the life of Jesus for a moment. How did Jesus exemplify clarity? He spoke truth to his disciples about who he was. He was the Christ. He was clear on who he was. Jesus stood against the religious leaders and said that prophecy was fulfilled through him this very day. He had clarity on why he was here and what he was doing. Jesus knew which disciples to choose to make apostles. He prayed all night. He had clarity in that choice. He made it clear that physical healing and miracles were not as important as spiritual healing. Because when you heal someone, they just died from something else later. But Jesus was clear that the heart is the thing that needs to be made new. And he always preached that. Jesus, with clarity, went to the cross, even though he knew it was going to be grueling, excruciating. But he had clarity in what he was doing. And again, we have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus was filled with. So let's strive to have clarity like Jesus did. You won't have clarity and you won't be clear on what's true if you don't spend time learning what's true. The Holy Spirit doesn't download everything to us at the moment of salvation. We get all of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, but then we grow. We walk in step with the Spirit and he teaches us how to live a life in accordance with him, walking in step with the Spirit. It happens over time. And we learn that with the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. You can only remember something if you already know it. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to help you remember the things that you were taught because you're spending time in the word. So Peter and John, the disciples, these apostles, they drew from a well of knowledge because they learned from Jesus. They listened to Jesus, and then later they drew from that well. They remembered what Jesus taught them, and with clarity they shared it. And some of you need better clarity. I need to grow in my knowledge of the Word of God, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. But there's practical ways to do that so that you can be clear on what's true. You have an opportunity to be clear on what's true because the Holy Spirit lives in you. So here's some practical ways to get clarity and to walk as Jesus walked. You can learn more of the Bible. You can learn a lot even online from the right person about the Bible. You can learn more about the Bible. You can be in the Word daily. There's opportunities to do that through the Bible app and through uh, memorizing scripture. There's apps for that. If you want to go really crazy, you can download Logos Bible software. You have to pay for that. But there's commentators and there's maps and Greek words and Hebrew and all of these things that you can get from these apps, especially Logos. But if you're struggling to get into a pattern or a habit of being in the word, 
Just download this app, do the daily Devo until you can get into a habit of being in the Word daily because you need clarity. You need to know what is true, and the way you're going to do that is by spending time in what's true, and that's in the Word of God. You can also grow in your prayer life. That's another way to have clarity. We hear from God by reading his word. We talk to God through prayer. Set aside time in your day to pray. Maybe not just for a minute before you go to bed, but when you wake up or throughout the day or on your lunch break, set aside time to talk to the one who can give you clarity. Make your request to him, praise him for things, have a conversation with the Lord. But these are practical ways to get more clarity because you're walking as Jesus walked. Jesus did all these things. He read the scrolls. He prayed to the Father continually. We're just following the example of Jesus. Another way is to listen to sermons, to read commentators, some good commentaries. One of my favorite guys is Warren Wearsby or Dr. Thomas Constable. Uh, Matthew Henry's good, but he talks like he's Shakespeare, so it's kind of hard to read a little bit. But those are just three examples of really good commentaries and commentators that you can read to help deepen your well of knowledge. Last example, maybe you can start teaching a class on Sunday morning. Maybe you feel like your well is deep, but now you want to share it with other people. Maybe teach a class or start a Bible study with people here at Thursday night. Let's have our first Thursday night group. Maybe you could start that. That'll make you more clear as well as you study scripture to help point other people to what's true. Learn, learn, learn. I'm, I'm asking you guys to learn the Bible. Because we need to know what's true because the culture that we live in is looking for truth and they're believing what they think is true. But if it's not in line with God's word, I promise you it's not true. But we, Christians filled with the Holy Spirit, can have clarity and share what's true. Because at some point, there will be times of testing. There will be difficult things that come. But if you're pouring yourself into the word and into prayer, then you're deepening your well of biblical knowledge and doctrine and theology and understanding of Jesus so that you can share it with clarity with people. When we have clarity, we can be outspoken and live courageously. So how did the Holy Spirit help Peter and John be like Jesus? He gave them courage, which is point three on your notes. The Holy Spirit gives you courage like Jesus. The Holy Spirit gave them compassion and clarity and courage. Let's finish the story in Acts chapter four, starting in verse 15. We'll read through the end at verse 22. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may be spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather to God, you must judge. Verse 20, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So these guys are like, I don't know. We don't know what to do with them. So go outside for a minute. Let us talk about this and then we'll bring you back in. All right. Go. So then they, they huddle up, they talk. They're like, all right, well, the dude's clearly walking. We can't refute that. There's a bunch of people praising God. A bunch of people just got saved. What are we going to do? I don't know. But we can at least tell them to stop talking in the name of Jesus. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. All right, let's bring them back in. All on the same page? Good, good. All right. Now they're on the same page. They bring them back in. They're standing in the middle of these people. And they say, all right, I don't know what to do with you guys, but just stop. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. And then Peter, remember the guy who was scared by a little girl two months ago? Are you with Jesus? No, I'm not with Jesus. Stop talking to me. That guy now comes before this whole council, the same people who crucified Jesus only two months ago, and he says to them, I'm obeying God. 
not you. If you want to tell me what to do, that's between you and God. But as for me, and it says John did the same thing, I'm obeying God rather than man. He's courageous. He's exercising that courage. He's putting that courage on display. It didn't matter what their threats were. Peter's hope was anchored in the other side. He knew what was coming. He, had, he was remembering the face of Jesus. Maybe, I'm using my sanctified imagination, but I mean, I probably would. I'm not going to deny Jesus again. He forgave me. He restored me. Yeah, I messed up, but he put me here in this position, and now I get to speak with courage to these people, and that's what he did. Your past does not define you now. We've all made choices. We've all done things. Things have been done to us by someone else, and it wasn't your fault. But whatever those things are, they're in the past, and God can still use you right now where you're at, and you can live in a courageous way. You may have failed at something in your life. Maybe you beat yourself up for that. Peter went out and he wept bitterly when he denied Jesus, but Jesus restored him quickly, and he put him on a mission. So maybe you have failed at something, but God wants you to live on mission. So why is it important that you become like Jesus and how do we become like Jesus? Well, the how is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you, sanctifies me and allows us to become more like Jesus. But why is it important that we become more like Jesus? Because each of you, myself, have been called to live on mission, to live for eternity, to share the gospel with people. The days are short. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, so we live on mission right now. And the Holy Spirit helps us with that. How did Jesus exemplify courage? He was bold in the streets by preaching a message of repentance. He fought temptation to the point of victory every single time. That takes courage. He stood before the council that would crucify him, and he let it happen. He courageously did that. And then he courageously went to the cross. And he courageously bore your sin on himself. He courageously took up all of my sin, past, present, and future. Courageously went to the cross. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And we have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus was filled with. So let's strive to have courage like Jesus did. So here's some practical ways to be courageous and walk like Jesus walked. Share the gospel with family and friends. You have an opportunity to do that. At Family Church, we teach you how to share the gospel. We use the three circles tool. If you don't know how to do that, we have wristbands. I can get you one. We can get you a book with the three circles in it. We can train you in it so that you are equipped in how to actually share the gospel. Our job is to be on mission and to share the gospel with people. So at Family Church, we want to equip everyone to know how to share the gospel. But it takes courage to do it. And the Holy Spirit allows you and helps you to do it. Pray for your waiter or waitress. That takes courage. Hey, we like to pray before we eat. Is there anything we can pray for you about? I've been doing that with my sister and my parents for as long as I can remember. And I, I counted loosely, but I think... All the times I've gone out to eat from like, I don't know when we started that, like I was 12 maybe, from like 12 years old roughly to 31, all the times I've gone out to eat, I think like eight people have said no to that request. Everyone else has given some type of prayer request. Some people have gotten saved sitting right there at the table. You never know what's going to happen by just simply asking to pray for someone, but it takes courage and you can step out and do that. Invite your one to church with you. Think about one person that you're really wanting to reach out to, that you're trying to invest in, to pull in and to lift up. Invite them to church with you next Thursday. Invite them to a Bible study group that you're going to, but invite them to come. Say no to the influences in your life that distract you from the Lord. That takes courage because there's people that surround you they surround me, and we got to ask ourselves, are they bringing me closer to God, or are they pushing me away? We're supposed to be in the world and draw them to Jesus, but if you you, you got to know yourself. If you're being drawn away from Jesus because of them, then maybe, at least for now, you have to say no to them until you're more built up in the Holy Spirit to have conversations that are gospel-focused to bring them in. And then 
becoming fluent in the gospel. Becoming gospel fluent is another great way. The gospel is a language all its own. So if you're speaking the gospel to yourself daily, becoming fluent in it, then you will be more courageous in sharing the gospel with people because you're spending time in it. Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and that whole group of friends, they called what they were doing Operation Aka. But it didn't end with their death because Jim's wife and Nate's sister and their families decided to move to that village. Just a couple years later, it wasn't long, less than two years, they moved to that Aka village and they shared the gospel with the very people that killed their loved ones. This family, those friends, they walked as Jesus walked. That's compassion and clarity and courage personified. What an amazing example of that. What's crazy is there's a lady in the church where Stephanie and I grew up in Ohio named Debbie Saint, and she is the niece of Jim, or uh, sorry, of of Nate Saint. She's the, the niece of Nate. And it's cool to hear her story And it's cool to see what these people full of the Holy Spirit did to take a courageous step into this area that was hostile towards them. But because of the Holy Spirit filling them, they were able to live out a compassionate, clear mission, courageous step to share the gospel with these people. And what's crazy is Um, I don't have a picture of that. I wish I did, but it was like 2001. I went to a Stephen Curtis Chapman concert. Um, Great Christian artist. He actually had one of those Indians on stage with him. And I got to meet one of those Indians who killed one of these people, but repented of his sin and put his faith in Jesus because of these men's courage and their families to continue what they started. So for you, you have an opportunity every day that you wake up to allow the Holy Spirit to control you. Be a willing participant with the Holy Spirit. Walk as Jesus walked. Philippians 1.6, one of my favorite verses, it says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit started something good in you at the moment you put your faith in Jesus. And I promise you, because God's word promises it, that the Holy Spirit will be faithful to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. He's taking responsibility for you because he loves you. But be a willing participant. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Lean on the Holy Spirit in your life. 1 John 2, 6 says, whoever claims to abide in him must walk as Jesus walked. Let's be that together. Let's take those steps of faith. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. The Spirit led Jesus into ministry and ultimately the Holy Spirit led him to the cross. And Jesus died for you. He died for me. He died for all of us. So collectively, let's live for him. Jesus was risen to give us new and abiding life. Let's live a life that's full of life. Let's be a church that's defined by compassion, clarity, and courage. Imagine what it would be like if Family Church Thursday night, let's focus on this service, was compassionate, had clarity in what we were doing, and had the courage to go into the community, invite people in so that they could hear about Jesus. I promise you have the ability to do it because you have the Holy Spirit, all of them, the full, complete Holy Spirit. My very favorite verse in the Bible is Ephesians 3.19, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So let's be filled with the fullness of God. Jesus lived in the power of the Spirit and he ended up going to the cross when it was difficult and scary, but he did it so we could be free from sin and receive the promised Holy Spirit. And we get to remember that sacrifice that Jesus made by taking the Lord's Supper right now.